religion. Yeah, I said, God loves you, and, and I want to give you this Bible. He saved me last night, and, and He'll save you too if you'll give your heart to Jesus. And he said, he handed it right back to me. Mm-hmm. He said, man, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm an agnostic. He said, uh, I, I don't want it. So he handed it back to me, and I didn't know what an agnostic was. Right. And I said, listen, I said, it doesn't matter if you're an agnostic, Assembly of God, Baptist, Church of Christ. <laughs> I said, it doesn't matter what you are. Jesus will save you too right now. And I handed it back to him. Welcome to another episode of Encounters with God. I'm so excited today. I'm with a new friend of mine. Pastor Bruce Rudd. He is the pastor of Mount Sylvan Baptist Church in Lindell, Texas, community just outside of Tyler. And um, I came across Bruce through a magazine. I read an article about him, and then I, I gave him a phone call, and I think it was just a God encounter. He was. Uh, it was a Sunday, early Sunday morning, and uh, Bruce was actually going to go preach a preach a sermon, but. Uh, he picked up the phone. We spoke briefly, and since then, our, our friendship has just kind of grown. So I think you're going to love hearing this man and uh, that God moves on behalf of his children and his people and his servants. It's going to be quite an ent- encouraging testimony to you. So, Pastor Bruce, I appreciate you. Well, thank, thank you for allowing me. Thank you so much. So. Uh, we generally just try to kind of start at the beginning. So tell us a little bit about your, your upbringing. I grew up in the Chapel Hill area, which is east of Tyler, Texas. Mm-hmm. Uh, we stayed in the Chapel Hill area, I guess, for uh, maybe till I was 16, 15 or 16. Right. And my dad was a commercial architect, and my mom was a, a housewife as well as she worked part-time at a bank. Uh, nuclear family. Uh, my parents were Christians. Uh, however, we were out of church uh, mm-hmm. for quite a few years. Uh, in fact, uh, up until I was in the fourth grade or so, and mm-hmm. then we got out of church. And just uh, had a good, really a good upbringing. My dad was a very hard worker. I had, uh, I have two other brothers, an older brother and a middle brother, and then me, and I'm a twin. I have a twin yeah. sister. And she's the baby of the family because I'm three minutes older than her. All right. And uh, so they're all Christians now. Praise and God. I was the black sheep in the family growing up and kind of went my own way. Uh, I actually got into alcohol at a very early age. Mm-hmm. And by the time I was in high school, uh, I had an addiction to alcohol. Mm-hmm. And then in my through my 20s and uh, I was a full-fledged alcoholic. Even though I had a good job, yeah. a good career, my life was far, falling completely apart, totally what, falling apart. What kind apart. of, uh, at this time, what kind of work were you involved in? At this time, by the time I, I got in my middle to late 20s, I was working for a, a really, really large mechanical contracting company in Colorado, and okay. our home base was Colorado Springs. And uh, I love Colorado Springs. Beautiful country. It is. Beautiful country. Got to live in Canyon City and yes. lived in Beulah. Uh, did a lot of hunting and, yeah. and trout fishing while sure. we were there. Uh, had a great career, but a personal life that was not going so well. Right. Yeah. So you're, you're really excelling professionally, but, you know, personal, spiritual life, kind of going two different directions. Yes. I, I was really, I was that scripture in the Bible that that says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul? I was was pursuing, trying to find my hope in the things of the world. I had a great job. I made really good money. And Mm -hmm. I I wasn't married at that time, praise the Lord. So I wasn't dragging a a wife or kids through it. But I knew that my life was not right. But in my heart, I thought I was a Christian. Mm. Because yeah. in my heart, I remembered when I was 11 years old and I had walked the aisle uh, with my twin sister and another uh, individual. And in my mind, I, I thought all I need to do is just follow them. But yes. I was, they were responding to Jesus. I was responding to just follow them. Yeah. I'm going to do what they do. Yeah. And through that, I was baptized and 
and I thought that I was a Christian, but the Holy Spirit from that time forward would always remind me that something was not right. You know, God is very yeah. faithful, Amen. and He spoke truth to my heart, and I knew something was wrong because He would remind me through the years, even in, in the alcoholism and all, I knew something's not right about my life, but Satan would lie to me. He's a liar. Yes. And he would whisper discouragements. He would whisper lies. Uh, I still believe that God in His infinite wisdom used the commitment. Uh, and and even though I wasn't faithful to Him and I wasn't born again, right. He was faithful to me yeah. in making sure to rescue the perishing. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I had family that was praying for me that I, I wasn't even aware of until after I became a Christian. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I, I can't remember who coined it. I don't know if it was Billy Sunday or one of the old revivalist preachers, but he called it the hound of heaven. The hound of heaven, and yes. Even when we're going astray like the prodigal or, you know, yes. uh, God is still pursuing after us, you know. Mm -hmm. While we were yet sinners, Christ still loves us and He's still coming for That's us. That's right. I can remember going to a a bar one night in, in Colorado, and and I'm embarrassed to share this, but I, I got really drunk. I was an alcoholic. I was lost, and sure. I was doing things that lost people do. And I can remember waking up. I, I stayed in my truck that night. I knew I wasn't fit to drive. Mm -hmm. And so I, after the bar smart closed, move. it was a smart move. Yeah. And even though I was making dumb decisions, that was a good one. Yes. But I stayed in my truck that night in the yeah. parking lot, and... And I remember waking up the next morning, and I didn't know where I was at. Mm, I wasn't yeah. sure what town that I was even in. I had It took me a while to regather my thoughts, and mm. I thought, what am I doing? What am I doing? I couldn't even remember all of that had transpired that night because of the intoxication. But God, how Jesus is a hound of heaven, yes. to build on what you just said, I found myself saying, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Help me. Somehow i got to get away from this. But I didn't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I was going to God in general, and God's trying to funnel me to Himself through the Son because there's no other yeah. mediation available. And God is trying to show me the mediation. Come to my Son. Come to my... Yeah. But He was responding. And I truly believe that I wouldn't be alive today there's so many instances just like that. Yeah. Had it not been for God's protection, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews one fourteen, I believe it is, that the angels that that are sent for those who will inherit salvation. salvation. Yes. And and I wasn't right. even saved. But yes. I truly believe that he had surrounded me by angels and I couldn't see them, but God could. Yeah. And uh and that he had a purpose for my life outside of myself. And that's the that's the good news about the gospel. The gospel is to, it, God has a unique plan for every individual. And sometimes yes. we think of God as just great big cosmic God, and all he does is look at masses of people. Mm -hmm. God is the God of masses of people. He's God of the universe, the, inf the infinite universe, yes. the stars and the moon. Is, but he's also the God of the individual. He will leave the 99 and go after the one. He'll go after the one. He loves people. He loves a person. I thought that why would God even love me? Sure. I mean, I've dishonored my family. Uh, I thought I was impressing God by making a good living and right. working hard. Yeah. I had a really good work ethic. Even with mm -hmm. the drinking, I had a good work ethic. Yeah, sure. And but but the thing was, I wasn't impressing God. No. And you know, I just I just felt that. In retrospect, it's easy to see, but at that moment, when you're in confusion with addictions or you're in confusion with the alcoholism, what you find yourself, you're, you're stuck in a cycle and you find yourself living in the day-to-day. -day. You're in a rut, and you think that there's no way out of it. Yeah. You feel like you're in prison and that there's no escape from this, so you, you what you do is you find comfort in that environment. And that environment becomes the only life and hope you think that there is that exists. And it's so not that way. No, it actually leads to more sin and more bondage and more destruction as you, you know, it can start off real innocently. Yes, sir. Now, we're just going to have a social drink here, Bruce, you know, and then, mm -hmm. you know, the next day or the next month, it leads to, you know, five, six drinks and it 
steadily progresses for people. And um, yes, yeah. If I could live life again, I'd yes. say no. Amen. I'd say no the first time I took a drink. There's so many things I'd change again. And, you know, I encourage our youth here at the church uh, quite a bit that you have no idea the importance of your choice, choices now. Make mm. good choices now. Amen. And watch what God can do with your life. And you have all these years ahead of you that you can find fulfillment in Christ and purpose and just absolutely get to be used and it's an adventurous life. Faith is an adventurous yes. life. Your story is an adventurous life. Yes. How God has, has healed you and the things He's done in your life. And yeah. it's just amazing what He wants to do. Yeah. I think so many people, they think, uh, you know, the gospel or Christianity or churchianity, they've had a kind of like you shared, you didn't quite have the full picture. Right. You know, that they. They have this view that God's got this big stick and he's fixing to beat Ken over the head or Bruce over the head with this. But right. it's not that way at all. God is calling in love and, mm -hmm. you know, come come back, come back. And reconciliation yes. and redemption are all involved in that process. And, mm -hmm. you know, we know Bruce and sure as a pastor, you minister to a lot of people, but kind of maybe uh, if you would just take a moment and, um, just share a little bit about deliverance. Uh, yes. How did deliverance come about for you? Uh, and people who are struggling with drugs or alcohol, uh, what advice would you give them? Uh, uh, first of all, say yes to God. Uh, whatever, whatever God is doing in your life right now, and, and it doesn't matter where you are, if God has has spoke to your heart and He's convicted you and there's a church down the road and, and you've passed that church every day or whatever and God is saying, you need to be there, I would say say yes to God. Mm -hmm. Quit saying no to God because what God wants to do, the reason you're having these thoughts, and if you're in an addiction, you feel like it cannot be fixed, whether it's an addiction to drugs, pornography, uh, addiction to alcohol, it can be a number of things. But you feel, because Satan lies to your mind. He lies yeah. to your spirit. He was lying to me, and I was listening to the lies instead of listening to the truth. And that's why uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says that love rejoices in the truth. Rejoices in the truth. Why is there rejoicing in the truth? Why is there love and rejoicing in the truth? It's because it's the truth that can set us free. John eight thirty two. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So when you get in a Bible-believing church, listen to the Word. If you know a good Christian, somebody that walks in the Lord and their character lines up with the Lord, get on the phone and call them. I called my dad. I was an alcoholic, and I would call my dad nearly every night. And my dad didn't know what else to do. And he would say, Son, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. i say, Daddy, I can't get away from this alcohol my life's so out of whack. And sometimes I'd call him again the same night and I'd forget because I had drank so much. And he'd say, son, you've already called me once. But my dad was patient with me. And what I didn't know is because I reached out, that's the first step is you got to admit you have a problem. And because I reached out, but admit it to somebody that can help you and lead you towards Christ. Admit it to the right source. Jesus is your source. That's where the freedom comes, mm -hmm. is in Amen. Jesus. And I, I would just say that if, if you're struggling in anything, and you may you can be a Christian, yes, and you can be struggling with something, and, um, and, and, and just because you've got out of fellowship with God. I'm not saying you're doing habitual sin, but you're out of fellowship with God. And, and Jesus wants to meet you at your point of desperation, just as he did in John chapter 11, with Lazarus, uh, Mary and Martha were so sad at the loss of their brother. And Jesus comes. He waited two days. It seemed like, Jesus, where are you at? Why, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. But Jesus shows up. And when he shows up, the, then uh, uh, Jesus says that I'm going to do a work that's going to be for God's glory. And he, and he shares with Mary and Martha. He says, where, where is he at? Where's his body laid? And he had already been in the tomb for four days. And this is what he does to us. We're dead in our sins. I was completely dead in my sins. I was walking in my humanity. I was moving around going through life in my humanity. But I needed something to happen inside of me, a change in my heart, a transformation, a new birth. And God works a miracle. Like when you got saved, 
Yes. And that's what he did for me. I was dead. I was in the tomb of death. I was condemned. I knew I was going to hell if I died. And then it wasn't long after I began to get convicted. And I didn't learn this till after I was saved, but my mother and my aunt went walking every morning. My aunt was there. Both uh, my mother's still living, but my aunt's already in heaven. And my aunt was a very godly woman. Had won countless people to the Lord. A great uh, Sunday school teacher as well. And thank, so, thank God for those uh, elderly saints, mothers and grandmothers, and people in the church like that praying for us when we're amen. out running astray. Yeah, never discount the power of your prayers for those that are they're hurting because Amen. they were praying for me as they walked every morning. My mother had discerned I was lost, even though she knew what had happened to me at, as at a young age. My dad had discerned that, and they were all praying for me. I didn't know it, but they were praying for me. Mm-hmm. Later, I was in we we were doing construction projects, and we took a job in uh, Bonham. Texas. Yes. And in Bonham, Texas, uh, one morning I went out to the plan table to uh, get some things figured out before the men showed up, and it was right at daylight. And all of a sudden, I got convicted. This is the hound of heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about God or anything. I'm still an alcoholic. I'm still cussing like a sailor, living in in a way that is is definitely not bringing any kind of glory to the Lord. You're you're just being a good sinner. I'm just being a good sinner. I was a good lost person. I worked hard for my money and and so, uh, (laughs) and heard it put that way. And and, and I like that. That's what I was. I felt like I was a good moral sinner, but I wasn't. And uh, so I'm at the plan table and suddenly this conviction hits. Mm. And I, I called myself a sinner, and I never used those words. I never said sinner, but in my heart, I didn't say it out yeah. loud. I said it in my heart, but it was the Holy Spirit, see? Yes. And I said in my heart, I'm a sinner. I immediately got convicted so bad, the Lord needed another yes. The first mm-hmm. yes was I needed to admit to my parents that I had a, a problem so that they could be right. helping me. I knew they were Christians, and they could help me. And so... I went to the project manager. He had just got there at the job trailer. And I said, Dave, I said, I've got to quit my job today. And he said, is there something we did? And I said, no, this is the best company I've ever worked for. Mm-hmm. I said, I've got to go get around Christians. I don't like the way my life is going and where it's headed. Mm-hmm. I'm sick of sinning. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself when I'd say the word sinning, I never use this word. Uh-huh. I'm, <laughs> where'd this come from? <laughs> so I'm, I'm saying sinning. <laughs> Anyway, he kind of understood, but not really, and moved back to Tyler. Long story short, I go to work for a family business, and and I'm on this project, and we're staying in a hotel uh, so many nights a week while we're on the project, and every night after we got off work, I would go to the hotel bar. In fact, I got to know all the patrons that came to the bar regularly, just like me, and I got to know the, the waiters there at the bar really well. And You just got in the mix real quick, didn't I you? I did. Yeah. I was fellowshipping. And, uh, but I, I used fellowship- to do that too. <laughs> did you? <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord called you out of it. Though. That's, that's just yes. a blessing. And what's amazing is that's what happens is, is we do what we do because we fellowship with where we're comfortable. And I was comfortable around people like me. And so uh, I, that night, I went to the door of the hotel room to head back to the bar. And when I grabbed the doorknob, I'm starting to go out, and I felt this conviction from the Lord. I can't explain it. it when, when I say conviction, it's these thoughts that would hit me. Mm-hmm. But it was the Holy Spirit giving me these thoughts. Yes, And the thoughts were... If you go out of this room, it was like I'd never have another chance, and maybe I wouldn't have. Yeah. God knows all. The, he knows the future. He does. And and I, that doorknob became my valley of decision. Mm. I knew if I let go of that doorknob and kept going towards the bar, that God was telling me in my heart something that, that wasn't going to be good. Yes. And so I thought that's, the warfare was incredible, the spiritual warfare. So I go back in the room after holding that doorknob a while and contemplating. I go back in the room and I remembered there was a Gideon Bible mm-hmm. in a drawer that was often in that drawer. And I was kind of about halfway scared of the Bible. 
I knew it was there, but I wasn't reading it, but, but it was presence. It's knowledge. Just knowing it was there, God was using that. Mm-hmm. So I opened the drawer, and I get the Gideon Bible out, and I turn to the book of John. Didn't know what I was reading. I'm just there. And I, I remembered John 3, 16. I knew it somewhat. Yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's what made me go to the book of John. So I'm up around John chapter 14. I'm just reading and looking, and I could feel the love of God when I had that mm-hmm. Bible open. Amen. And I'm thinking, why would God love me? Yes. I've disappointed Him on every level. Why would He even love me? But I'm feeling His love, and it feels so good, but I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. It's just I know God is in this book, and I could feel it's the living word, the Bible says in Hebrews 4.12. It's yes. a living word. And I could feel His presence in that room. And so... I'm reading, and I'm feeling God talk to me, and I'm trying to understand what I'm reading, and, and the spiritual warfare is still going on, but God loved me, and I knew He loved me, so I wanted more of it. Yeah, He was given light, and I wanted to be in more light. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, maybe Billy Graham will be on TV, and I'll turn on the television. And so I clicked through the channels, and, and there's a guy preaching, and I thought, well, I'll listen to this guy, and it was sure. Pastor Hagee, and Pastor's oh, yeah. a church in San Antonio. Yeah. San Antonio. And now get this. And I've actually got to meet him uh, since my salvation. And I shared this with him at a Christian, met him by accident at a Christian mm-hmm. bookstore in Waco. Awesome. But anyway, the while I'm looking in the book of John, and, and I'm in John 14. It's a good spot. Good spot. <laughs> the verse God used to open my eyes to who Jesus is, is John 14, 6. Mm. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No yes. one comes to the Father except through me. Yeah. So I turn the TV on, and there's John Hagee preaching. And guess what he's preaching on? He's doing a series on the seven I am's. And he's preaching on, I am the way, the truth, and the oh, life. No wow. one comes to the Father except through me. And I'm thinking, how does that guy know yeah. where I'm at? You know, I'm thinking, this, but it was God aligning the dots. It is. And so I began to to realize, because I thought you had to be a part of a certain religion. Mm-hmm. You got to be a, either Baptist or Assembly of God. I yeah. was lost in religion, not knowing it's a personal relationship to a Savior. Mm-hmm. And so I realized through that verse, the Lord opened my eyes. He opened my heart to understand that Jesus is the only way, and I couldn't wait to receive Him. And I didn't know what to do to receive Him. I just I believed right then, and I know now that I was saved at that moment because you believe in, from your heart under righteousness. Yes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. salvation. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so I'm calling on the name of the Lord, and I'm like, I can't wait for him to get through with this sermon. I'm, I'm ready right now. <laughs> Let's wrap this up, yeah. yeah. So I got the TV on. It's just blaring away, you know, and commercial come on here and there. And I get on the, but I'm listening to him. And I get on the floor. And at that moment, this is the best way I can describe it. I gave Jesus the title deed of my life. It's kind of like if like you sell it. a car. I mean, this is so much better. This is a horrible analogy, but it's, it works. Yeah. And I had to transfer ownership because, yes, I wanted God's blessings in bad times and low times, His forgiveness in bad times and low times. But what I wanted is not what He wanted. He wanted all of me. Mm. I just wanted Jesus for when I needed Him. He yes. wanted me for all time. He wanted to save my soul. Yeah. So I got on the floor and I said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Lord, if you'll show me the truth, if you'll save me, I'll follow you all the days of my life. That's repentance. Yeah, it is. And so at that moment, I felt the burden of sin roll away completely. Yeah. The alcoholism, I never, since that day, I have had no other drop of alcohol. Mm-hmm. Praise God. It hadn't, because it no longer, I had a drink that was satisfying in the earthly world. Yeah. But I needed a drink that would satisfy for eternity. And when I got Jesus, I got a drink that satisfies for eternity. Yeah. He changed my life. The Bible says, "You old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. You're a brand new creation. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that yeah. you can give your life to Jesus, it's, you just got to turn your life over to Him. You got to admit. You got to be honest with God. You got to be honest with your pain. You got to be honest with your addiction. You got to say, God, I just can't handle my life anymore. I don't want to be boss of it, and I certainly don't want to go to hell when I die. That's good reason right there to get saved. Hey, I don't want to go to hell. I felt like I was on thin ice, mm-hmm. and if I didn't get the Lord didn't save me that night, I was going to fall through and bust hell wide open. It was none of me. It was the Holy Spirit doing all the work. 
Yeah, it's a work of grace, a grace of grace of God. I think so many people, like you talked about, you gave the title deed to Christ. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people they have like they call upon God. It's like you know a genie in a bottle or something. You know, yeah. We'll shake. We'll we'll call on God when we need Him. But if you study the New Testament, like like I'm sure you have. A, all throughout the book of Acts and uh, throughout the epistles and so forth, it talks about our Lord mm-hmm. and Savior, Jesus right. Christ. It Absolutely. Was, it wasn't just, uh, you know, we're going to show up at Sunday and hear a 30-minute sermon from the pastor, and then we just go out and do what we want to do. That's right. It was a total commitment of their lives. Mm-hmm. And for many of them back then, it was life or death. I mean, they— That's true. Like, yes. We might not face the same— Persecution, the persecution and situation, yes. they could get burned at the stake, you know, get lit mm-hmm. up or thrown to the lines. But I think that's so important, the point you made mm-hmm. there. And uh, I think that if scripture in Ephesians 2 1 is, you know, some people think, well, you know, if I can just reform, if I can go do 12 steps, and that might mm-hmm. be a good program for some people, uh, yes. different programs. But, mm-hmm. you know, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Right. He came to make dead people live. That's right. And everybody out there, including you and me, we're dead in our trespasses and sin. Mm-hmm. We're, we are the walking dead, so to speak. That's right. And it's only when yeah. the Spirit of God comes into our life and it's we so accept powerful. Christ, you know, that we become alive again. Amen. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful because, you know, Isaiah is very clear that our iniquities have separated us from our mm-hmm. God. It's it's yeah. and. We are lost. You know, it's because of what Adam and Eve did in Genesis 3, the fall. And that's our grandparents. And yes. we inherited that sin nature, so we're born in iniquity. And that's the that's the good news of the gospel. The gospel is really simple, but we complicate it. We do. The, the simplicity of the gospel is that we want to somehow work to earn God's favor. But the gospel is just <laughs> the opposite. Jesus did the work, and we have his favor if we'll receive him. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, he says, for those that receive me, he gives the right to become children of God. I think what's cool is when you come to Jesus and you give him the title date of your life, we're always thinking, I want to sign something, or like you said, or there's a program we want to go through. We always want to do something where we can feel like we achieved something with God, yeah. and then now we've earned his merits. But salvation is by grace. It's because he loves us. The Bible says because of his rich love and mercy. And he loves us, and that's why he left heaven. And he came, and, and I, I like the gospel. Here's the gospel in short form right here. Here it is. Okay. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of a virgin. The reason is is that he couldn't have that same blood nature that you and I have. He was God. He was Emmanuel, God with us. Okay, He lived 33 years under the law. The Bible says in Galatians that he was born under the law to redeem those who are under the law. That's us. The Ten Commandments have condemned every one of us. The Bible says if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all. And then in Galatians 3.22, the Bible says that Scripture has, it's like a prison. Scripture has confined all of us under sin. So, and then we all fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But here's the good news. Jesus is born at Bethlehem. He's born of a virgin. He is he is the incarnate God. He's from everlasting. He just took up on flesh so he could identify with you, so he could identify with me. Hmm. He lives the life you and I cannot live for 33 years, perfectly fulfills the law that we couldn't fulfill. Then here's the next step in the process. Jesus goes to the cross, and on the cross, all of the judgment of our sin, he puts it on his self. And here's the great mystery of the cross. When he's on the cross, he gives his life for us. He gives it as a substitutionary death. John tells us that he had received the power to take his life and to take it up again. Mm -hmm. Yes. He laid it down. He laid it down. Take it up. He said, Father, into thy hands, after darkness for three hours, after he had absorbed all of our wrath, then he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And it's beautiful because what that means is is that the work is finished. He had already said, it is finished. Under thy hands I commit my spirit. Yes. And immediately the Bible says his head dropped. Nobody else can do that. I cannot command my own death, nor can you. Mm-hmm. But Jesus, 
was murdered on the tree. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. That they murdered him. They were putting him there to kill him. That was their goal, was to kill him. They were jealous of him. They hated him because he came and he shook things up See, by yeah. telling the truth. And they hung him on the tree. They put him there to murder him. But what they didn't understand, <laughs> they Amen. were fulfilling a gospel plan yeah. that had been figured out before the foundation of the world. Yes. And that's the gospel. Then he resurrects three days later. And I like to think of it like this. On the third day at the resurrection, think of Jesus as holding pardons in his hands. Now, here's the good news. You say, but they're just pardons. They're generic. Mm -mm. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, meaning my name is on one of those pardons. Yeah. Ken's name is on a pardon. Amen. And your name is on a pardon. And so what he does is he has your name on that pardon, and he's saying, just come receive it. Give me your title deed of your life, and let me have it. Just let me have your life. Surrender it to me by faith. Surrender it to me. And then watch how I change your life. And, yeah. and a good way to remember it is like this. Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. You owe a debt that you cannot pay. And that's what the gospel is. Yeah, good way of summarizing it. So, so you've accepted the Lord here. You've <clears throat> quit your job. And uh, this is what, about 1996 or so? In this frame around, time? around July of 1996 when I got saved. Okay. So you walked away from that. Uh, so what was your experience in between there? I know you had a, a time probably of growth and mature, maturity, mm -hmm. learning the scriptures, getting more familiar with the mm -hmm. teachings in the Bible and uh, praying and so forth. So where did you spend your next few years and how did that uh Lots of growth in that time period and, and still growing and will always be growing. But I, I yes. would say that that just summarizing it and looking at it, of course, the good news is is the change was immediate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, just just for this information. Kind of like Saul to Paul. Yes. You and, had your Damascus Road experience. And exactly. You were this way one day and the next day, bam, you're So hungry else. for God's Word. I couldn't put it down. I carried it to work with me. Uh uh, just read the Bible every waking moment I had time to read it Love and it. still do my work. And I even carried a New Testament in my tool pouch. Uh, <laughs> what's Man. what's funny is how the next day, this is so not me that before this, mm -hmm. uh, before salvation, the next day I went to a Christian bookstore there in Corsican. I got saved in Corsican, Texas in a hotel. So I go to this Christian bookstore and I bought a whole bunch of New Testaments. And I'm going to the job. This is, Everybody on the job knows me as... He's the party guy. I'm the party guy. Yeah. 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 And so I go to the job, and I'm just handing these New Testaments to people. I mean, coworkers and, and people with other subcontractors and saying, look, Jesus saved me last night. I learned something. It's not about religion. It's about Jesus Christ. If you give your heart to Jesus Christ, he'll save you right now. I mean, today. He did it for me last night. He'll save you. So I'm going to give you this Bible. And I was doing that with, with quite a few people, and I got to this one particular guy, and he was pretty intimidating looking guy, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I hand him the Bible, share the same spell, God loves you, and it's not about, uh, well, I hadn't got to the part on him about the religion yet. I said, God loves you, and, and I want to give you this Bible. He saved me last night, and, and he'll save you too if you'll give your heart to Jesus. And he said, he handed it right back to me. Mm -hmm. He said, man, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm an agnostic. He said, uh, I, I don't want it. So I, he handed it back to me, and I didn't know what an agnostic was. Right. And I said, listen, I said, it doesn't matter if you're an agnostic, Assembly of God, Baptist, Church of Christ. <laughs> I said, it doesn't matter what you are. Jesus will save you too right now. And I handed it back to him. Well, he went ahead and took it the second time. Yeah. Found out later that just out of God's providence, he, he comes back to me a couple of weeks later, and he says, by the way, he said, uh, you didn't know this. No, it wasn't, I think it was the next week when I came back to the job. He said, you didn't know this, but the Lord, uh, I guess, used my grandma because I got a card in the mail from my grandma that mm -hmm. she's praying for me. And so I, I n didn't see that guy because he was back off the job after, later after that, but I always wonder what God's done with but that. But it's those little things like that mm -hmm. that even this man recognized, you know, some things you and I, you know, we can manipulate or we can orchestrate or we can put a plan together. But when you get a card out of the blue or things like that happen, you just know it's the hand of God, God trying to change that man's heart. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. It, it's just he is faithful. Uh, 
you know, later after that, of course, uh, in 1999, I opened my own business and that did really well. While I was called to preach, God had already called me to preach. In fact, I was called to preach within the year of my salvation, but I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I had right. to grow. I knew there was, sure. so I, I began to serve in our local church. I can't, Cannot overemphasize the importance of a local church. It's, uh, important. it's so important. Get plugged into a good Bible believing church somewhere makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it is the fertilizer on the garden of your growth. Is Amen. the church, and so I began to grow. Uh, uh, was later uh, ordained as a deacon and served in buildings and grounds, and I taught Sunday school for quite a few years. Uh, and so as time went by, by 2001, somewhere along in there, I'm getting this absolutely a conviction and a drawing from God to to surrender to the ministry that was mm -hmm. just beyond anything. I mean, it was just happening in all kinds of circumstances and ways, and I just couldn't get away from it. I was preaching everywhere I went, and, and, and I thought, God, why would you call me to preach? But the calling was there, but I wanted to make sure it was from God. I didn't want to do something that I think yes. was from God. Mm -hmm. So I kept praying and asking for all kinds of affirmations. Long story short, we did. God spoke to me one night very clearly, not audibly, but in my heart, and He said, now's the time. So I told our employees, uh, to plan on for about six months to start looking for a job and that I'd finish up our current contracts. And when we got through with those, that uh, I would had surrender to the ministry. And I told Teresa, I said, look, you know, because we was making good money. And I said, Teresa, yeah. that's my wife. And I said, Teresa, yes. we're going to have to go and start yeah. wherever God wants to start us. We yeah. may have to live in a tent for all I know, but we're going to start wherever we want to start because this mm -hmm. is what I want to do. I want to live for the Lord and use my life for His glory to the very fullest. And if that's the direction He's calling us, yeah. let's just say yes. Mm -hmm. Say yes. And so... We said yes. The Lord has blessed. I, I attended Southwestern Seminary in Fort Worth for a year. Uh, took my first church in the Mahia area, and then we've uh, we did revivals for several years, and then we've been here at this church since 2011. We knew that God had—it's almost like God had prepared us in life for the ministry we have today in this church. Thank you.